my video starting, pulling up the notes, maybe, Corley Moore, Firehouse Vengeance Weekly Scrap, number 154. Today's guest is Mark Von Oppen, a member of a California fire department since 1998. He is assigned to the Suppression Division, where he holds the rank of captain. Uh, he, he has served on committees of the state level for training. He has contributed into firefighting curriculum for writ survival. He has written articles. He instructs. He speaks. He is highly sought after across the country. He is the creator of the fire service leadership program, fully involved. And I was, I don't, firehouse vigilance would not exist. And the weekly scrap would not be here if it was not for this man. And so it is my pleasure, 100% to have you on the weekly scrap number 154, my friend, Mark Von Oppen. Thank you, Corley. Thanks for having me, man. It's nice I'm to be back. So. Very, very excited to have you back on, brother. Anything I missed in the intro? Anything you would like to add? Uh, can you do it over again? I want to hear it all over again. Okay. No, I actually got a longer one. I, this is That's the condensed version. I got a lot more highlights. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That was great. Thank you. Um, I don't know what you said, but it was awesome. Thank it you. was awesome. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, everybody, I want to tell everybody right out the gate, um, this one's going to get interesting. I have a lot of things to throw at Mark, and, and he has a lot of stories to tell. Uh, tonight, Kyle Romagus is back after his birthday bash last week. He is fielding your questions, the audience. So get them in here for Mark and myself. Uh, Kyle will grab them. Romagus, the smooth war cartel, will grab the questions and throw them on the laptop so that I can throw them at Mark. And we will see if we can stump him tonight. Uh, I want to hype the membership. Go ahead. Don't do that. That's not nice um, no. to try to stump me. That's not nice. One. Two. I was thinking about this the other day um, about Kyle Romagus. How awesome and like powerful of a last name is Romagus? No, it sounds like some Roman legion leader or something like that. I mean, just like Romagus. Yes. You know, like anyway. So sorry. Anyway, go on. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. I like tangents, brother. Believe me, especially when they involve Kyle's name. Uh, I don't know where I was. Oh, the membership. The membership of the Vigilantes. Uh, if you want to be a part of the Vigilantes, man, go to firehousevigilance.com. You can sign up. Uh, coming up at the end every at the end of every month, we do a, a live forum is what we call it, where we just get together and discuss things. This time we're discussing the book It's Your Ship by uh, Michael Abershoff. We usually discuss something tactical. Last month was electrical fuel fires. This month, I don't know quite yet what we're going to talk about. Maybe May Day uh, and commanding a May Day, but uh, I'm not sure yet. But anyway... If you want to be a part of it, go to firehousevisuals.com, see how to sign up, uh, and then we'll do the housekeeping. This episode is brought to you by Keyhose. Go check them out on Facebook, at Keyhose, the hose experts. Uh, Elkhart Brass, they are a safe fleet brand. Affordable Drill Towers, home of the Affordable Drill Tower and the Affordable Standpipe Prop. They are firefighter-owned and operated. The only thing that you can do that you cannot do at an affordable drill tower is live fire. So affordable drill tower, you can repel, stretch hose, lines, go through the stairs, go through the floor, do window bailouts, cut holes, uh, uh, the roof, use the roof props, use the apartment balconies, pump into the FDC or flow water into the sprinkler system. It's amazing. Call Steve at 844-55-TOWER or drop an email to info at affordabledrilltowers.com. And then uh, I'm very pumped about this sponsor tonight because this is one of the, along with Mark Von Oppen and... Uh, national fire radio i think fit to fight fire might be the other part of my history the reason why firehouse vigilance exists and that's uh, fit to fight fire so proud uh to have john spears logo down there uh the podcast is coming back soon he said soon he didn't give a date but soon so it's coming back so be excited about that fit to fight fire believes our level of fitness and training will make the difference between life and death for others, providing us the purpose and discipline to consistently train. Head on over to fittofightfire.com to become a part of the community where you will get a daily workout and so much more. Fittofightfire.com. Again, very excited. So, housekeeping out of the way. Now, Mark, before I let you talk, I'm going to catch us up on comments. Joe Gavita said, Good evening, fellow scrappers. Excited for this one. Marco, good evening. Let's get fully involved on the scrap tonight. I like the play on words, it really is a good job. Smooth board chiming in said word. Here we go. Hyped up. Lots of hype. Mark has had such a positive impact in my daily company operations. Looking forward to more inspiration this evening. That comes from Jared Van Eck out of South Carolina. Love that dude. All right. There we go. We're caught up and we're ready to kick off the scrap. Mark, are you ready? I'm ready. I appreciate you putting up with me. 
<laughs> I love I'm you, gonna, man. It's awesome. I'm going to lead it off with uh, this question that I asked Kyle last week on his scrap. And it was uh, something that Justin McWilliams posted in Facebook about fires are down, you know, the 3% or whatever it is since 2010. But civilian deaths are up twenty, almost 25%. And I just want to just kind of just it's a it's a it's a broad very broad like flat slow pitch to you to say what are your thoughts on why this is the case? Uh, well, I mean, that's kind of a it is a broad, broad. based question, and there's 100%. a lot, there's a lot of there's a lot to it, and I could I could get very anecdotal about um, you know, my thoughts on it, but you know, the, probably the better guy to ask about it would be Brian Brush or Anthony Castro or guys like that, that participated in the civilian rescue survey, um, that kind of thing. Uh, cause they've got all the stats and can probably get deeper into the whys and wherefores. But I just off the top of my head, um, you know, having you throw this question at me, I, I suppose, you know, part of it probably stems from the, the, the culture of safety. Um, the whole notion that, that, um, our lives are more important than, than the people that we um, show up and swear that we're going to protect their, their lives and their neighborhoods and things like that. And, and then, and I'm not trying to put it squarely on the shoulders of the fire department, but I mean, just, you know, um, but that culture I, I think would certainly have contributed to it. And, you know, you know, going back years ago to Ray McCormick's FDIC um, address where he talked about, you know, culture of safety is is nice and everything but what we really need is a culture of extinguishment yes and along with that goes you know goes um you know a, an aggressive m mindset and and an aggressive mindset comes from being training and edu trained and educated and and skilled in your craft and and feeling confident in your abilities and then you're you're willing to push yourself that much further than people who aren't so um you know, I, I'm sure there's a number of factors that, that, that play into it that I'm not even touching on. But I guess the, the thing right off the top of my head is, you know, I'm going to accept some of the responsibility for, you know, trying to be ready. And and, and if if I'm going to look in the mirror, um, you know, uh, and, and try to be I'm going to try to get better every single day. And and I think that, um, you know, there's there's a tremendous amount of turnover that we're experiencing in our fire department right now where we're probably getting ready to hire a third of our department a lot of those people coming in have no experience and they're they're right out of school and and with you know um the amount of calls we're running now and the the things that we've experienced in our department in terms of trying to keep up with budgets and and different deployments and stuff we simply can't train like we used to we can't get together with neighboring companies and train and go out of service and train because we don't have enough units in the system to absorb the slack if we get multiple calls so um again a number of things i think um you know but i think it, it's a cultural thing um on the fire if we're looking at it from a fire department side you know we got to make sure that that we're doing our first due diligence and and doing our homework and so that we can you know when we are you know showing up with fewer resources than we've had before that we're better prepared than we've ever been to to show up and do work so I love the answer, man. I really do. I really do. Especially for not giving you any heads up and just kind of throwing a curveball out the gate to you. Uh, yeah. Don't do it again, please. Thank you. All, all, I got, <laughs> all I've got is curveballs. Everything we talked about, none of it. None of it's coming at you. No. Uh, awesome. Uh, and, man, I – yeah, I think you really nailed it on the head with uh, Ray McCormick's speech, The Culture of Extinguishment. And uh, Well, I think that that's out there. I think that there there is a tremendous – want and need for uh, you know for people to firefighters like being firefighters we like training we like we like getting after it um there, there's so many things that that can pull us away from that stuff so many you know so much data entry and and so many things that divide our time and take us away from the primary mission of you know being able to stretch lines four stores do searches and, and things like that you know um and save lives um and I, you know, the focus on EMS probably has something to do with it. I, I wanted I mean, to bring we're, that up, but well, we're, you know, I, I, we've been doing EMS and transporting and all that stuff since the days of Johnny and Roy, um, in our department, and it's been very good for us. Um, but we're starting to shed engine companies and add ambulances. You know, I got hired in, in my department, and it's just the the changing nature of the business, and and. You know, being so data driven, you know, we're we used to have seven engine companies in the town that I work in, and, and now we're down to four. 
And uh, we used to have two full-time ambulances. Now we've got three. We're looking to add a fourth. Um, so, you know, we did a lot of cross-staff and we tried that for a while and that wasn't great for membership and wasn't necessarily um, great for service either. So we went in a different direction. We're not cross-staffing engines and ambulances anymore, but the, the trade-off of that was we lost suppression equipment. So now we've got fire suppression equipment responding from farther away. Um, second dues are coming from farther away. Um, so it's just, I mean, I'm sure all of that yeah, plays a hand in, you know, fire development and not know, one uh, reason, just a, a multitude of reasons. Yeah. I mean, we could go in any different direction you wanted to with that. Um, and you know, plus I think you know, people are just home more. Yeah. I mean, my wife and I had a funny discussion right before we came on she was talking about, you know, doing zoom meetings and things like this. And she was saying, you know, people just need to go back to work. And I'm like, yeah, they do. And, and, you know, um, you know, so it's that, you know, who knows? I don't, I don't really know, but. Um, no, no, it's a great answer to a, to a yeah. multifaceted question without a doubt. I was going to save this question for later, but I saw Brian Brush say something about he's the best. I'm assuming he's talking about you. So. No, I'm sure Brian's actually probably talking about himself. Um, Cause he's just like, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, he's, um, no, Brian's awesome. I miss him. I miss uh, both you guys. I need to come out to Oklahoma and, and, uh, go to uh brokeback mountain or wherever you guys are going to see um <laughs> me and brian are going to brokeback mountain to teach a class and then we're driving from there to see brumley in broken bow yeah yeah oh oh well i want to go see brumley um 100 percent. no yeah. you need to come you need to come it'll be the road trip of von oppen moore and brush and what we'll could, make it what could possibly what could possibly go wrong well, that's what I, that was the question I was going to ask you. Have you ever made a fire call or a, made a response in Oklahoma? Uh, yes. Uh, funny you should ask that um, since we're on the subject of Brian Brush. And a uh, um, number of years ago, I came out and was doing a – I did a class that – I don't know. Brian set it up, I think. Um, it was in Oklahoma City or somewhere right around there. I can't remember. But um, – he picked me up at the airport and, and, you know, we're, we're driving in his, his, uh, his training captain's buggy or whatever it was, pickup truck. And we're driving down the freeway and I'm talking nonstop. Like I always do not paying attention to anything. And, and he's eyes on the road and, and he goes, he goes, Oh dude, check it out. And, uh, I look and, and there's a, there's a semi kind of jackknifed in the middle of the freeway. Traffic slowed down. I just thought traffic was slowing down. And then there's a there's a Jetta that was on its side, and he goes, "Oh, dude, we're first on scene." I'm, that's that's how Brian talks, by the way, dude. He says, "Dude, a lot." So, um, so he goes, "Hey, go check it out." And before the before he even stops the truck, I've got the I've got the door open, and I'm trying to jump out. He's like, "Dude, wait, don't jump out!" And so I, he finally stops, and I, I jump out, and I climb on top of the, the vehicle, and like this this semi had sideswiped this Jetta, and you know the Jetta went out of control and rolled over, and there's a lady inside, and I pop my head in and hi how you doing and she's like oh i'm okay i just can't get out and so um so uh brush came out and you know i'm standing on you know i don't know what i was standing on standing on something to try to look into the car and uh he comes up and he's going to stabilize the vehicle and he had one one piece of cribbing like one <laughs> one wedge piece of cribbing and he shoved it underneath like the the uh you know the top of the vehicle or something like that to stabilize it and you know, his work was done so it's uh it's kind of funny and then you know uh, a gang of guys from oklahoma city showed up and uh um you know, they were thankful for that and... one piece of cribbing mm-hmm. yeah. made the difference so yeah I, I have made a call and it was with brush with brush and the lady was fine and, you know despite our best efforts she she survived she made it so so are you coming out to attend up in tulsa the class me and brush are teaching and then oh, then the road trip to broken bow you're in right uh, sure. Okay. Let me, well, let me just check my calendar. I gotta, I gotta coordinate like three calendars. I got the, the home calendar, the work calendar, and then the, the fully involved speaking calendar. calendar. So Absolutely. No, I'll we'll pick you up. Out. We'll pick you up at like Tulsa airport and you can just catch the second half of the road trip. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Uh, the rogue mindset. I, this is actually the first actual question I had planned that was uh, the rogue mindset, man, because I love the rogue mindset. Being a rogue has always been a huge part of your message. Uh, first, I'm going to say, like, kind of just touch on to the audience what a rogue is to you, how it started, and then I'll get into how has it changed. But first, the rogue mindset, where it started, and what it means to you. Well, it all started, um, the whole rogue idea started with um, just not being satisfied with 
first myself and and uh, who I was and trying to get better and then working, you know, through through being introduced to a number of people in the fire service who really inspired me to be better. Um, you know, take a lot of classes and go out and, and opening my eyes to a lot of things. I, I learned a lot, took a lot of classes outside my department and then tried to bring those things back to my department and was met with some resistance. And, and I can't remember what the circumstance was, but we were trying to put on some training. And uh, anyway, I got in trouble with the battalion chief and where the whole rogue idea thing came from was I, I probably ran my mouth a little bit too much, which is weird because I never do that. But um, I, uh, I wrote an email to him because I was mad about something regarding trying to put on quality training and having it be squashed and people saying it was over the top or whatever it was. And I, I wrote a hundred sentences to him. Um, and I said, I will never again, try to ensure the quality of fire department training. And I wrote it a hundred times and, and sent it to him. And, uh, this was years and years and years ago, by the way, this is probably 15 years ago, but a little um, more immature Mark on Oppen. Yeah. More on that later. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah. And so I, I that's kind of where it came from. You know, I was pissed off saying, Hey, we're trying to do good things. And we're trying to try to make us all better and move us all forward. And why are you standing in the way of this and et cetera, et cetera. And so, you know, there was a small group of us when I first got promoted to company officer that um, really was hungry to be better and wanted to be out, be dirty, um, pull lines, you know, uh, for stores, do searches, do all those things that, that I really, those are probably my favorite things to do um, at work. Um, and, and we got, you know, some people thought we were nuts. Some people thought that we were over the top and too crazy. And so um, somehow or other, you know, they said that we were going rogue. And, and, and then I had a discussion with Jerry Smith, who's the head soccer coach at, at Santa Clara University for the women's side and one, has won a number of national championships with them. And I was talking to him somewhere, I think it was at a Christmas party. And you know, we were talking about, you know, his coaching philosophy and how he approaches, um, you know, coaching his teams. And, and he said, you know, who I'm really concerned about, you know, there's a certain number of people who are on board of the program. There's another, um, another group who could go one way or the other with good leadership and direction. And then there's a, another group that's this group of rogue individuals who don't believe in what I have to say, maybe don't believe in the message at all, maybe even hate me as a coach. They're the ones that I really want to try to capture. Right on. And, and if I can capture those people and, and bring them in, then, you know, we can go, well, we can, you know, they can't stop us. And so that's what I you know, thought was genius. And, um, after having many, many beers, I still remember the conversation. And that's where the, that's where the, uh, article rogues came from that I wrote a number of years ago. And, uh, so I took that and kind of ran with it and it, 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 we were trying to make it a positive thing. It's like, if, you know, if you're, if you're saying that, that, uh, training and education and, and trying to make yourself better and trying to, you know, live up to who you said you'd always be is a bad thing and we're going rogue and then damn right, we're going rogue. And so, you know, people kind of took it the wrong way, you know, saying that, you know, we were, you know, uh, none of the message with fully involved has ever been about breaking the rules or doing anything like that, but it's been, you know, it's trying to push the envelope and, and make ourselves better. And if that makes you uncomfortable, so what, you know, right and, on. and so that's, that's kind of where that came from. And then it, it has sort of evolved. Um, and that's what I wanted over, to touch on because over the, over the course of time, how has the message of being a rogue evolved in your, in your, uh, as Mark Von Oppen has matured as a person and a uh, firefighter, human being in general? Well, I think that if you're asking me specifically, um, for me, how it's evolved for me is, um, I think early on there was some ego involved, a lot of it with me. And it was kind of a, an ego trip for me to kind of, you know, puff my chest out and, and walk around and, and kind of, if, if people felt threatened or intimidated by us or what we were doing or by me, I kind of actually kind of enjoyed it. Took some pride you know, in kinda, it. Yeah. Kind of, yeah. well, I kind of welcomed the challenge, you know, and it's like, it was sort of, you know, challenging the old guard and, and all that stuff. And, and now, now that I'm a little bit more pragmatic and I'm, I'm kind of towards the end of my career, it's kind of like, all right, you know, I, I try to, how do I say this? Um, just, be more welcoming of, of new ideas and, and different ways of doing things and realizing that it doesn't have to be done my way. A big epiphany for me 
a number of years ago, I was sitting in a in a room uh, with a lot of really smart people, and I didn't belong in the room at all. Um, but it, it was a number of people in the fire service, and and Alan Brunacini was one of them in the room, and we were talking about you know how our careers have evolved and, and what were big changes for us. And there was one gentleman I can't remember who it was. But he said he, his big struggle in the in the fire service um, and what really led to a lot of heartache for him in the fire service was this need for control and and having to control things and and um, and he said once he realized that the world didn't need him to fix it, it was very freeing for him. And so I think that you know along with that, one of the things that that I kind of realized. Um, and I think I kind of knew it all along, but I think, like I said, my pride, my ego got in the way a lot uh, a number of years ago. Um, was there's a, there's a lot of really good, talented, smart people out there, and there's a lot of different ways of doing things. And our jobs as people, you know, that are that are out there and connected and, and know a lot of people in the fire service is to bring ideas to our organization and introduce people to them and then let them run with them, you know. And mm -hmm. so, um, and it's not it has been very freeing for me to to let go of some of that mm -hmm. stuff and realize, hey, it's not even, I mean, really, if you think about it, it's not even our fire service anymore. I'm, I'm going to be 51 next month. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm on my way out. You know, our job is to to show people all the good stuff that, that we bring to the fire service and, and or, you know, that we've created in the fire service over the last 30 years and, and let them take it and run with it, you know, take it and, and, you know, turn it into something else, turn it into something better than we ever did. So, you know, that's kind of the evolution of the whole thing for me. No, it's awesome. And <clears throat> just to be clear, it's not that you're not still challenging the status quo or, or finding new ways to do things or saying, can we do better? It's just, you become more pragmatic and gotten your own ego out of the way. Is that, is that really the change? Yeah, I think, well, I think that, I think that when you're, when you first come into the fire service, you're very naive and very starry eyed and very just excited to be there. Very just, you know, and we're still, you know, I still have that little kid in me that still loves coming to work and all that. And right on. But I think, I think the farther that you go, you start to run into some brick walls and you run into the organizational friction that you have in every organization and it, it can make you a little bit jaded. And so then that can turn you sort of into, I say that there's kind of a progression. You go from being um, the starry eyed new person who's really naive to this kind of, if, if you, you know, start working and start getting out there and seeing what's going on, you can start getting kind of radical, like as a, as a, as a, as a person who wants to change things. So you become sort of radicalized. And that's kind of where I think that fully involved was when it first started. I mean, if you really look at a lot of that stuff, what really drew people to it was I was pissed and I let people know about it. And if you don't think that that caused me some strife at work, you're, you're high. Um, for the dead, I, you know, so, um, you know, you, you become sort of, you know, you start at naive, you become radical. And I think the farther that you go, you try to find ways to make your message more palatable to more people. Um, because that's really where true change occurs is when you find a way to take that same message that you've been saying for years and years and years. And um, if you can make it more digestible to more people, then you're going to that's when you really shift the sands on the intended shore. You know, saying something crazy and throwing a rock in the water makes a big splash, but a lot of times it doesn't, like I said, the, those ripples kind of die out and and you, they, they just, you know, fade out across the water. The, the, real, the real proof is when those, those waves reach the intended shore and they change, change things and shift the sand. So um, I think that that's been probably the biggest changing me certainly um it has been that you know trying to find a way to make the message more palatable um and still retain some of that edge um so that you know more people are receptive to it i love it man all right get your questions in so i can ask them of mark and right now going back to my notes um, well, hold on you told me Yes. You told me that you were going to tell me how you think the message of the rogue has changed. How do you think it's changed? I want to, I'm going to flip the script on you. I'm going to ask you a question. How I think the how message about, of the rogue is, I think I, I really do think that, that uh, from an outsider looking at you, especially because for me, you're the rogue that, that, that wore the rogue sweatshirt and have, have been the champion of the rogues. You know what I'm saying? 
like it or like it or hate it, you were the 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 tip of the spear, so to speak, or the torchbearer. Um, and and knowing you and having conversations with you through the years, I think it really has been about your uh, removing of yourself or the ego, which I don't think was ever an issue of it. I think the the anger and the um, frustration really resonates, and it still resonates with so many people because there is so much anger and frustration with the brick walls, the administration, the, the friction of organizations, the, the inability to make a change, the uh, sometimes lack of perspective from not being in a different position and seeing stuff and saying it's this simple when it really isn't. Um, I think that uh, all of that plays into uh, the maturation of the rogue uh, label. And that, that to me is the big thing, but I think the, ultimately it's when you can honestly, the humility that comes with being a rogue now, does that make sense? The, that, that's yeah. the difference between the early rogue that lacked humility and was ready to smash plate glass windows with bricks versus the new rogue who is, I'm not saying lowering the standard. That's not the point at all. It's now I think, I think what I'm hearing you say and, and what I keep thinking is, as you're, as you know, we're kind of, Sure. ruminating on this is is i think it's patience is what it is i think it's the long game like if we're gonna if we're gonna quote like simon sinek he talks about that about how it's it's the infinite game and we're, we're playing a long game and if we want to if we want to achieve real change and sustain it and make things better you, know, you got to take that passion be patient you know and and you know make that passion your purpose be patient and then when you put passion purpose patients all together that's when you get progress and so that's the four p's that i sometimes talk about when i remember um is you know passion purpose patience progress because unbridled passion and i think sometimes that's where it was early on with fully involved was it was just it was just this blind passion and it was just you know wanting to strangle people and say you know sure. why don't you love this as much as i do you know right. and and, right. and people don't necessarily respond to that and so finding a way to say hey you know it's okay to love the job. Hey, it's okay. Hey, it's okay to let me speak up for you. Let me be the person that gets in trouble. Don't get yourself in trouble in your organization. Send me a message. I'll talk to you, you know, that kind of thing. And I've had a number of people reach out to me over the years that have been in the same, same type of position and been frustrated and, and, you know, I'll talk to them and hopefully it makes a difference. Um, so yeah, I mean, Michael Osom said, Marco, I Osom said, Mark, as a, as once a rogue, how do you deal with a new rogue in 2022? How do you deal with a new rogue in 2022? Um, I'm, I, if I'm understanding the question or if I'm, how I see that is, you know, I was young once too, you know, and, and you got to remember, you got to remember that we see things differently the longer that we've been in the, in the fire department. And, and like we said, it's all about patience, right? It's about patience when you're dealing with those people. It's about, it's about understanding where they're coming from and having empathy and saying, Hey, listen, we'll get there. We'll work on it together. We're in this together. Um, but just communicating with people and, and creating trust is a huge thing. Um, and I think that, you know, that's where I think I felt so misunderstood when I was young and trying to change things in the fires in, in my organization, first with my company and, and stuff like that. But I felt like no one would listen to me. And I think that, you know, if, if you're trying to deal with people these days, and if, it, if we're talking about dealing with young people that, that want to change and want are kicking and screaming and want to do something different, um, listen to them and give them an opportunity, but don't silence them. Because if you try to silence them, um, you know, then that's when you run into real trouble. You know, that's when they're going to start acting out and, um, you know, working against you. Again, it's like Jerry Smith said, it's like, you know, I've got these people who maybe hate me, don't understand me, aren't, aren't along with the program. But if I can speak to them and engage them, I can bring them along. And then, you know, that's that next group of, of people that's going to change the world in terms of the fire service, the people that have that passion, that are excited about the job. I mean, if you look at the people that, that you know, uh, the group of people that really inspired me, I mean, I, you know, um, you know, the game changed and things shifted. And so now, what I feel like is there was a group of people that, that really, you know, 10 or 15 years ago were really instrumental in shaping how things went in the fire service. And now things kind of changed. I mean, it's kind of cool to trade. It's cool to, it's not cool to sit on your ass and do nothing. And I don't, so 
I mean, it, it's it's more difficult for us to get out and train. But I don't I don't think I think I mean I look at like where we are and, and maybe this is my perspective and maybe it's skewed because of who I see and who I hang out with. But I think that you know I, I feel that we're better as a service than we were um, you know as a whole. Right. Um, you know, probably 20 years ago because of oh, without a the doubt. proliferation without a doubt. of, I mean, Aaron Fields talks about how, you know, the internet and social media and all that stuff is, is more influential the, the way that we communicate than the, the invention of the printing press. And so our ability to share information, I think that, you know, I, you know, I, I know certainly as an organization, we're more skilled uh, in the fire department that I work for. Uh, we're more skilled. We're better at pulling hose. We're better at forcing doors. We're better at doing a lot of the firefighter skills than, than uh, we were when I first got hired, certainly. You know, I think so. without a doubt. I think the internet, um, a provided the medium, and then, mm-hmm. uh, you know, people can say anybody anybody can start a, a Facebook page and say they're an expert. But but the cream rises to the top. The messages that resonate rise to the top. It it there there is a uh, vetting system in place by uh, you know people can down uh, knock on likes and dislikes and things like that. You can't come into the internet and bullshit people for very long. I mean, it's yeah. just not going to happen. People have it's, a pretty good bullshit meter. Yeah. yeah. Even, uh, even so. you know, so you can say what you want about, about, uh, but that, but I want to say is like things like, uh, fully involved, fit to fight fire, you know, national fire radio, these things that are, uh, and I don't want to say popular. It's not the right word that th- these things that have resonated with many, many people have shrunk the American fire service and brought it together and put a focus things like engine company resurrection. And I, I don't want to keep naming names cause I'll leave out too many, uh, contributing factors that have, have been part of that revolution that have shrunk the American fire service and erased the excuses for being ignorant of, uh, modern tactics, strategies, priorities on the fire ground, et cetera. No, it's great. And I think that, I think you hit the nail on the head when you said it's about bringing people together. Yes. Um, and it's not about, it's not about, you know, rivalries or, you know, this leadership guy or that this host although we're excellent at that also we're excellent at divisiveness and and ripping people apart so we're the best yeah uh, well as a nation right and we Without need to stop doing that we need to stop doing that shit so i wanted to throw this at you because you posted this the other day and it was uh if you want to uh, no, wait. i mean if you put max effort into the job some people will put max effort into tearing you down uh-huh I love the meme, so I'm just, bring, I'm just I'm getting ready to throw memes at you. I got like four or five questions to ask you also, but I wanted to – because this kind of ties into what we were just talking about. Well, I think that I think that anytime you're into the job and you put yourself out there, right, I, I don't think that you can be an inspiration to some without being a joke and, and an embarrassment to others, right? A punchline, so, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So any, anytime you're out there, I mean, you know, I, in, in trying to, to make a difference, people are going to, you know – some people are going to think it's great. Some people are going to buy it hook, line, and sinker and think it's great and, and understand the good in the message. And other people are going to just, you know, poke holes in it and just, just, you know, talk shit about it incessantly. So, you know, we tend to focus way too much on those few people who attack or do whatever. Cause there's, there's so many more people that, that think, Oh yeah, it's cool. They don't, or they don't really give a shit one way or the other, but you know, the, the, the barking dogs, the ones that, that, talk badly about you're the ones that stick out in your mind and, oh yeah and those are the ones that they, they it, it hurts i'm not gonna lie to you but um but you know there's so many more people that that believe in you know all of the good stuff that's going on in the fire service and it's um and the messages that are out there there's a lot of good stuff out there but you can't let those couple detractors and i'm totally guilty of it i mean like 100%. anytime any, I mean, anytime <laughs> anybody has anything negative to say about me, I obsess on it. And I mean, I drive my wife crazy and she's like, Oh my God, don't listen to him. And it, we have these arguments too, but not arguments, but I, you know, we give each other the same advice. It's like, you know, if, if, if she's got something that's bothering her, I'm like, Oh, that's no big deal. Don't worry about it. And then I catch myself doing that. And she says the same thing to me. So it's much more easy. It's much easier said than done, but um, you know, we got to just focus on, you know, what we're doing because if, if you're doing something good and your message is good and true, the detractors don't matter. Um, but you just got to know that there's going to be those people out there that don't have anything to, better to do than sit in their underwear in their parents' basement and troll you on the internet. Yeah, I love it. Which I don't know if you remember this conversation. It was probably, I don't know, it might have been 2018, I believe. So we're getting old. So a while back. But uh, I was asking you about how awesome it was to be Mark Von Oppen at a fire department. And, and, and it was general discussion because it was one of the first times I'd met you. I brought you into my city to teach a leadership class. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I was like, just, man, how awesome is it to be you at your fire department and things like that? And it was kind of an eye opening moment for me. Cause you told me something. It's like, well, it's just, 
and I, I'm not dogging anything, but this was the conversation that really stuck with me. You said, hey, Corley, they bring in leadership experts to teach at my fire department, you know, mm-hmm. and, and I'm just standing there going like, no, not like, why didn't you ask me or anything like that? That wasn't the point. It was just like, uh, it doesn't happen at home. No, and I think that I think that it's hard because when you're when you're so close to something, when you're right in the middle of it, it's hard to see um, the forest or the trees, right? Yeah. Um, and and a lot of times, outside voices. I mean, people see me at work in, in a completely different light. I'm a, you know, I'm just I'm just, and I am no matter what. I'm just a totally normal person, right? Um, you know, through through social media and some other things, you know, you you have this. It has this way of. I don't know if it's elevating you or what, or making you seem like you're something other than you really are. But um, I've always tried to be genuine and, and tried to be true to who I am and what the message is. Um, but for sure, I mean, you talk to anybody that, that that does things within their department or does things within the fire service at home, it's kind of like, oh yeah, that's Mark or, or that's Ray or that's Corley or that's Brian or that's whoever it is, you know, it's um, so, um, you know, but I think that when you look at, quietly like without really you know um a whole lot of fanfare or or grandstanding or standing in front of your department you can really look at the changes that you made um the things that the way that you've contributed in a positive manner to the overall culture of your department um and sometimes your friends need to remind you of it and you need to remind your friends of of you know you know thanking them for supporting you and, and reminding them of the good that we've all done together you know, I've, I've been frustrated beyond belief sometimes in my department and and felt like we were working and working and working and not making a ton of headway as, as a culture and in a lot of different ways. And then and then, you know, you'll have a fire or something like that. And, and the crews that went to it just knock it completely out of the park and crush it, and do everything right. And you're like, wow, that was amazing. But maybe they were paying attention to what we were what we right. Did you know, hollering at them, you know, about for the last 10 years or, you know, like I've, I've had, you know, cause you have friends that you can find in and stuff. And I've you know, just had conversations with some of those guys who are like, Oh, Hey man, look at how far we've come. Look at what we're doing and look at all the things that, that we've done together. And, um, that's where you really have to pause and take inventory of, of the good that you're doing because we're so hard on ourselves in terms and, of wanting like change you said. that if, we we but, hear those we hear the barking and we take it way more serious than we take all the other. Some for right, some whatever and, and, reason it holds a lot more weight in our brains. Well, yeah. Well, I think it's because sometimes you, you if you you really look at it you kind of feel like maybe there's some truth to it maybe you know you do need to look in the mirror or something like that. But I don't know. I just think that like I was saying we're so hard on ourselves that we need to give ourselves credit for the wins that we get within our organizations even if they're small, because we don't give ourselves credit for the wins that we do get because we are such type A personalities. If we don't you know, give ourselves credit once in a while, uh, we're always losing. And if you listen to those barking dogs too much, you're always losing too. So. I love it. I love it. Uh, questions coming at you. One from Lee Humpy. Uh, Humphreys, the Humpmeister, he said, what advice do you have for dealing with the chief that is not into the job, just along for the ride for his last couple of years? So a checked out chief tail end of his career what's your advice well i don't know if i have any real advice i mean i'm not really sure i mean i know that chiefs do really i mean kind of chart the course of the organization and things like that um and and set the set the tone within the organization but you know i was in a a company officer class a number a number of years ago when i was you know working on my company officer certification and I was a firefighter and the battalion chief leading the discussion about uh, what the most important position in the fire service was or in the firehouse, whatever the, the fire department was. And, you know, going around the room, it was, you know, uh, everybody was saying battalion chief, battalion chief, battalion chief, battalion chief. And, and because there was a battalion chief leading the conversation, it gets to me and I go, company officer. And he goes, why do you think that? I go, well, because they're around all the time. They have the greatest influence on people that are running calls. Or something like that. And, you know, they're they're around all the time. You know, chiefs aren't around all the time. I mean, chiefs chiefs have different things, and that's what we need to understand, that they're responsible for that have really nothing to do with running calls. You know, I mean, right? Yeah, they, 100%. They budgets, they, you know, 
they, they provide us with the equipment that we need and, and give us budgets for training and stuff like that. But I mean, in terms of running calls, we, we handle separate stations. And so I guess, you know, my point to that is, you know, if you really can't let what's going on above you, the things that you can't control really affect your day to day, you know, come into work, enjoy what you, what you love about the job. Don't sit around and bitch about the fact that you're not getting any leadership and direction in your opinion from the fire chief. I mean, maybe the fire chief's a perfectly good guy and you just don't like him. Who knows? But you know, they're responsible for a whole lot more shit than we even realize until you really start talking to them. And then, you know, if, if you're just training and running calls and, and doing what you're supposed to be doing in the firehouse, cooking meals, working out, doing things, doing cool things together and, and getting your reports done on time. I mean, now what? I love it. <laughs> you know what I, mean? I love like, it, man. I, Dude, I think I it's, just, I think it's one of the best answers I've heard to that question. Cause that's a tough one. That, that's, I'm guilty of it too. I mean, I sit there and I, but I, what I really I sit around complaining about, you know, some, some fire chief that you just think is ineffective. It doesn't do anybody any good. It's like, that doesn't, that doesn't get you better at throwing ladders or pulling lines or doing whatever. It's like, get out, train. And, and, you know, you know, we have such an influx of youth in our department right now that if we sat around and bitched about everything that we could bitch about in our fire department, that we would never get anything done. Furthermore, we're corrupting, the next generation of people who are so excited to be there. They're so stoked. And I try to remember who I was when, when I got started and I was so excited, man. I was so naive and just so I'm doing it. It's like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Do it. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> but, uh, more on that later. Uh, but, um, maybe, but no, it's just, I it just, it doesn't matter. I guess, you know, if you feel like the chief is ineffective, it doesn't matter. I mean, are they, are, is there diesel in the rigs? Do you have band-aids? Do you, I mean, do you have water in the tank and can you run calls? Okay, cool. Then the chief's pretty much doing his job, you know, and it's your job to, to get out there and deliver kick-ass customer service, even if you don't feel like you're getting good leadership. Hold on, I got to mark it. I got to, I got to soundbite it for the, for the sound clip. Yes. That's beautiful, man. Uh, Bryce Campbell says, how much of an impact was Bill Walsh, your dad and other coaches you grew up around? And I know you do a whole section on mentors, but it's a great question. Yeah, I, it's, I can't even begin to describe or put into words how influential so many coaches were um, in, in my life and, and my development and how I see things. I mean, Coach Wall certainly, but not really until I started to, you don't really understand it until you start deconstructing like who you are and how you think and, and really seeing what your influences were. My dad certainly, um, you know, and, and I had really great high school coaches. I mean, you know, my, my high school football coach, Ron Calcagno, who you know, probably really nobody other than anybody in the Bay Area has ever heard of, was one of the winningest high school coaches in, in probably the state of California. And, and just the work ethic and even my position coaches, I mean, those guys, those guys coached us so hard and, and pushed the team mentality so hard, you know, putting the, the team and everything above yourself um, that, you know, we had, there was no number one on our team. Like you couldn't have the number one on our team because it was a single digit. And, and, you know, it, it just, there were no superstars. You couldn't stand out. You couldn't be different. You had to be in lockstep with the belief system, play with pride and poise and all that. And it's just, you know, that, that's where, I, and I was so afraid of letting them down um, and letting my teammates down that I think that, you know, that's, that's why I love the football um, uh, you know, I make so many football analogies in, in the, the teachings that I do and the things that I write because it's all about doing your individual job and winning your individual battle every single day and being the best you can, simp- you know, simply being the best that you can be so that you're living up to the obligation to your fellow humans, you know. And I, I think that what scares me is, is there's, you know, I know football's back and all that stuff, but for a while when they were talking about, you know, there was some talk of maybe getting rid of it because of concussions and things like that. And yes, we have to protect people and stuff. There's so many valuable life lessons that we learn in sport that, that that's why I can't understand people that aren't involved in team sports. Um, you know, but <laughs> certainly, um, certainly those, all of those men who, who coached me along the way, um, you know, and, and I picked up a lot of things, you know, unbeknownst to me when I was younger, I mean, they, they were a tremendous influence on me and, and I didn't even understand. And I said this, I say this all the time. I didn't even understand what I was witnessing when I was around those people. Um, you know, the best and brightest in the game. I mean, you know, um, it was so, just a Tuesday afternoon to you at the time. 
Yeah, yeah. it was. It was just, no, that's you know, crazy. Riding, that's crazy. Riding with dad to the office or, you know, just doing laundry and hanging up. There was just taught me a work ethic, too. I mean, they, they made us work pretty hard as kids, you know, in the locker room. And we were, we were, you know, at the field house before 7 o'clock in the morning. We were there till usually after 8 o'clock at night. I mean, we had breaks for meals and stuff. But we were working pretty hard. Paid us 100 bucks a week back then. So Beauty. It was fun. Yeah. <laughs> All right, make sure I still have you framed up. <clears throat> um, Josh Davis, he wants to know, how do you combat becoming a yes man by playing the long game yet wanting to fight for the guys in the job? <clears throat> uh, you can still advocate for your guys and still do the right thing. I think if, I don't think that they're mutually exclusive. And I mean, I think, I think that you can, I think that you can do a lot of the things that people are asking you to do. I mean, fight your, you can choose your battles, but I mean, if, 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 if the organization is not doing right by your people, I don't think that you can get in trouble for standing up for your people. I don't think you should. I mean, you, you might, um, but you know, I've also said, and, and I believe this to be true that if you, if you stand up for your people, uh, you could find yourself standing behind the door when it comes time for a promotion. Um, I have said that. And, you know, it's kind of in the way that you do it. There's there's people who have a way. And I don't have a way. I, I, I'm not very good at it. Um, but there there is a way to be diplomatic about things and stand up for your people and, and still um, accomplish the mission that your organization is trying you to accomplish, trying to get you to accomplish um, and sell it in a way that that isn't career ending. Me personally, uh, I'm permanent and stationary uh, as a company officer. I will never promote beyond this level because uh, my mouth doesn't formulate the words to say what I just said. Like, I can't, I can't do that. I can't enact it. I can't <laughs> live it out. You know, I, I wear my emotions on my sleeve. And so I, I don't, like I said, I don't think that they're mutually exclusive. And when I look around, I see people that, that I feel, you know, in my organization for sure, that do right by their people are strong leaders. And they still, I mean, there are people that I admire in my organization that I think are way better captains than I am. I'm like, I wish I was like that guy. You know what I mean? As a, but um, you know, because they, they have the way, they have the ability to sort of deftly navigate those kind of um, tricky situations where right. I just get, I just get pissed and I just, mm. you, know, <laughs> you can see it, you can see it on my face and, and it's over. Um, so I don't know. I, I think that you can still stand up for your people um, and, um, and still do what the organization expects you to now if it's completely if the organization's asking you to do something crazy. Asinine, right, right. Right. I'm not going to do it. But. Usually not what we're talking about, though. It's, <clears throat> But, yeah, <clears throat> misalignment of values on the on the whole. I love Pacifico, by the way. That's one of my absolute favorites. Yes, 100%. Did you say you had one at dinner tonight? Absolutely. Dinner in, tonight? Honor, in honor of my West Coast Boudreaux is what I actually said. That's right. And that's <clears throat> why I'm having one tonight. Perfect. So. Uh, I can even see it. Dave. Dorelco? Dorico. Man, correct me on my pronunciation. Any any advice on how to communicate the blue collar mindset to a very white collar driven admin? Uh, again, I don't I don't <laughs> think that they're mutually exclusive. I think that they're they're going to want their data points, they're going to want their spreadsheets, they're going to want those things because we're a very data driven industry now. Um, but they also have to understand that we're going to we're dirty and it's a dirty job and and uh, I mean Sometimes I think people get so task saturated at the staff level that and they're so concerned about budgets and spreadsheets and things like that, that they do forget like what a blue collar job it is. But um, oftentimes it doesn't take very long to, to do the data entry or make sure your reports are done on time and, and then, you know, do whatever you got to do administratively and then, and then just getting back to the blue collar stuff. I mean, I, again, it doesn't really matter what, but, you know, those people think in terms of that, they're going to want their data points. They're going to want the things that they want and you need to do those things. You need to get them done to keep yourself out of trouble. But then, I mean, shoot, that takes maybe half hour, 45 minutes out of your day at most. And then get your ass out there and train. I don't know. I just, I think that for me personally, I mean, I, I've, I've used that as an excuse. Sure. Oh, sure. You know, they're, they're asking us to do too much, blah, 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 blah. Well, I mean, part of your job, like if for me, my job as a company officer is to figure out how to get all those things done. And then still accomplish what I need to accomplish with my crew. And then if I got to stay up later or, or if we get a call at three o'clock in the morning and I'm behind on reports 
and we had to train during the day and I, I put the reports off. If I'm up at three in the morning doing reports, I'm doing reports at three in the morning. Right on. That's what right I signed. That's what I signed up for. Love it, man. Love it. Um, <clears throat> Rick Dunn wants to know, Mark, what do you feel is the best way to engage the passionate firefighter as a leader? The best way to engage a passionate firefighter? Uh, listen to him. Like we said mm. earlier, I mean, mm. find out, find out what, um, have empathy for them and understand that you were young once too, and you were fired up and, and don't silence them, you know, but make sure that, you know, they know how long the leash is, make sure that they're operating within the limits that you set and then give them the opportunity to, um, exhibit what they're passionate about. Generally speaking, there's something, there's some subject matter that they're super excited about that could be leveraged to benefit the organization. Take that passion and say, Hey, listen, you know, in exchange for, you know, the opportunity to teach and, and, and share your passion with the department, here's what I need from you. Um, and I understand where you're coming from, that sort of thing. So, um, you know, uh, if, if that person is, is passionate and they're, you know, someone who isn't necessarily along with the program or talk shit, just say, Hey, listen, I'll give you this opportunity, but you gotta, you gotta chill out with the shit talk and, and support the organization. Uh, cause we all have to move the ball forward together. Right. I don't necessarily believe in everything. Right. But I have to I have to champion that for the organization. So um, but, you know, passionate voices are the ones that move everything forward. So listen to them and just have those conversations with them. But love don't it. shut them down. Christopher Armager, I love your question. Can you give me some more specifics on it? Because you're asking about change for the sake of change. Can you give me an example or something I can throw at Mark? Because I want I want to know what you're thinking. And then. I'm not sure if that is what that whole section is there or not. It may be a very detailed. We'll see. Kyle clue me in. Scott Frederick wants to know with the newer sensitive culture of modern life, how do you feel that will impact the way future leaders are expected to train their companies, new hires, senior men, et cetera. And how will that impact the leadership training for current and future leaders? There's nothing, but <laughs> nothing. And that came from uh, Scott Frederick. So just so you know, you can blame him for the really soft toss. Well, I, I actually don't think that's that tough of a question, really. I mean, because that's something that I actually grapple with every single day. So, I mean, I, if I understand the question, how do we speak to the sensitive culture and still sure. get the message across that we need to get across? Perfectly that articulated. Body. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's how I took um, it. <clears throat> I, I think that there's ways to communicate what you need to communicate. And, you know, uh, I, I, I certainly know that I've had to adjust – you know, the way that I communicate and I have to be much more deliberate in, in my communications just because, you know, you just, you want to be as inclusive as you possibly can. And I think what I try to do in, in, in that regard is try to put myself in a position where, you know, what would it feel like to be in a group that feels like they're marginalized and, and have, again, empathy is another big word. I think a lot of, I mean, a, a big word in this conversation absolutely um, is I think that all truly great leaders are empathetic at their core. Um, so I try to, I try to work on that every single day. And I, I try to not just shoot my mouth off and, you know, just cause you believe something doesn't mean that it's right. You know, I mean, and there's a lot of different belief systems out there. And, and I think that the, the problem in our culture nowadays is it's, it's this or that instead of saying, Oh, it can be this and that. And, and there's, there's a lot of room for a lot of different points of view. And so we have to be sensitive to that. So I guess it's, it's just making sure that, you know, um, if people know that you're speaking to them and you care about them and, and what you're saying comes from the heart, I think they're going to be a lot more forgiving. People want you to be honest with them. So, you know, if, but it starts with, with having dialogue with people and sitting down and talking to them and saying, this is where I'm coming from. Tell me where you're coming from. This is what I expect from you. This is what you can expect from me. And then if, if I say something to you that is offensive or likewise, let's have a talk about it. Let's talk about it here and don't go running behind my back and tattle on me or put me on blast on social media and, and cancel me. It's like, you know, let's just, let's be humans and deal with it. So, I mean, I think that that's the most important thing. I think people appreciate that, that if, if you, even as, as hypersensitive as we seem to be nowadays, um, I think if people know that you're making a solid effort to try to communicate with them, especially as old people. I mean, I'm shit. I'm old now. You know I mean? I, and <laughs> how hard I, does that, I, how hard does that hurt you to say out loud? Oh, it's easy. Now I get it. I'm, I'm old. I'm a dinosaur, but I think that, you know, I, 
I fancied myself to be pretty, pretty open-minded and I grew up in a super diverse area and, and everything. And I find myself, you know, really questioning sometimes, okay, am I going about this in the right way? Am I, you know, cause I mean, as much as we micro categorize things, we overanalyze things and, and um, you know, it's, you just, you have to be, you gotta be careful, you know? But I, I think that again, if, if you talk to people on the front end and say, here's where I'm coming from, this is how I communicate. And if I say something, just tell me about it, talk to me, we'll work on it together. I don't want to, I don't want to make an uncomfortable work environment for you, but in, in the quest of, you know, trying to accomplish what we need to accomplish, I can't be walking on eggshells around you all the time. If I right. say something that upsets you, talk to me. That's all. So pretty simple, honestly, it mm -hmm. usually is. Uh, Chris Armager has this going on. He said, we have a majority of great people. We have great equipment. Admittedly, we struggle with consistency. When we start to hit a stride in the right direction, there's always a minority that wants to go rogue. It's like they can't just be satisfied long enough to recognize or enjoy any level of success. Like some people feel they have a responsibility to go against the grain, but aren't intelligent enough or experienced enough to see we're headed in the right direction or where we should be. How do we handle people crying for change for the sake of change? Long question. I just wanted to get very as detailed as I could. Well, change for the sake of change isn't good. That's just busy work. You know, so I mean, I, I think that that's a how do you combat that? I don't know. Prove prove why the change is necessary. Prove why the change, you know, have them prove why the change is, is necessary or good or in the best interest of the department. Um, so it ties back to know, communication on the honestly. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, I mean, and, and I'm not sure I'm understanding the question completely, but, um, you know, I, I think there is a point where you, you, you know, it's healthy to have that never satisfied mentality and it is healthy to try to try to, um, push and, and move forward and, and constantly try to get better. But if it's, it's only healthy if everybody understands that that's the goal, right? If, right, if you're not, right if you're just doing it just as just to and people feel like you're nitpicking but like you know one of the things that i communicate to <clears throat> one of the 10 expectations for for me as a company officer is never satisfied and right you can expect me to every time we have a run i'm going to talk to you about what we did well and then i'm going to also talk to you about what we could have done better myself included and and people as long as you communicate that on the front end and say i'm not just seeking change for change sake or just trying to create busy work for you you know, there's there's real things where we can shave time off of an evolution or we can we can you know give better customer service and let's let's work on those things you know um and and i think people will start to crave it when it's done in a constructive manner if it's right. just just because you're on a, on a power trip or something like that like we said earlier like you said earlier people have a pretty good bullshit meter and they'll know when you're doing it just to be on a power trip but if it's if it's coming from a good place and you're you know I think that people will be way more on board with it, but communication is key. hundred percent. I love it. There you go. Uh, I love this next question and I'm reading it strictly how Kyle Romagus posted it to be read. So from it's this, Romagus. this question, Romagus, <laughs> I am Romagus. That's the name <laughs> of the fire service. Pretty sure. DJ motherfucking stone. That was how, that's how, that's, I'm, I'm not sure if that's his Facebook profile or just how Kyle wrote it. But he asked, Mark, when are you writing a book? <clears throat> uh, as soon as I stop making excuses and get off my ass to do it. I, it's largely assembled. Um, but I have this whole, I don't know. I, I just, I'm a, I'm a huge procrastinator. <clears throat> and um, that's that's it. So um, DJ MF and Stone, I don't have any other excuse other than the fact that I'm a, I'm a massive procrastinator. And uh, I actually have a title for it. And nobody better steal it because it's on file with fire engineering. Um, it's called The Deliberate Leader is actually going to be the name of it. Ooh, and, nice. um, well, that's because fully involved leadership was already stolen. Uh, funny story. Um, I was at, uh, not stolen, I'm sorry. I shouldn't say that. Um, I was at FDIC a couple of years ago and Frank Viscuso goes, hey, you know, and Frank's a prolific writer and he's awesome. And he goes, we were standing at the author's booth and uh, the only reason why I got to hang out at the author's booth was because I was I was considered an author because um, 
uh, oh gosh, uh, Paul Combs and I did a calendar a couple of years ago. Right on. And I wrote the text for his drawings, uh, his interpretations of the fully involved stuff. So um, technically, I was an author, so I get to ride the coattails of like Paul Combs and people. Love it. <laughs> like that. Yeah. So, um, which is nice. Uh, so anyway, Frank, Frank pulls up his phone. He goes, did you see this? And he, he holds it up and there's a book called Fully Involved Leadership. He goes, what do you think about that? I'm like, well, I think I should have written the book a couple of years ago. And then the guy wouldn't have written the <laughs> book with my title. So um, that's that's shame on me. But it'll be it's uh, the subtitle is going to be something with fully involved in it. But it's going to be called The Deliberate Leader. And it's oh, I love deliberate. I love deliberate. I love intentional. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Chapter outlines are done, things like Stolen. that. So I just gotta get. I just every day I do it too. Hey, just keep, like, oh, just keep procrastinating. It. Keep procrastinating. I'll finish up this one, and I'm gonna write the deliberate leader. Yeah, nice. <laughs> I got um, you. Well, I got I you, homie. I think it's it's a, Mark Hansen that wrote the subtle art of not giving a fuck. Did you have you read that? Uh, I have, yes, actually. And okay. the, yeah, and the other, but yes. Do you remember he talks in the in the book about how social media is such a distraction that it actually keeps you from doing things that 100%. you should be doing, i.e., writing a book. And and part of part of that is I do spend a lot of time on social media. You know, I post daily. I inter- try to interact with people and stuff like that. And so um, by interacting with all of you, that's why I'm not. <laughs> that's why it's their why fault. Ever, it, it's clearly. I'm Clearly, it's the audience's shifter. fault. Such a blame shifter. So, <laughs> accepting no responsibility for for my procrastination. So, yeah, so that's why. I love but it. There's there's a, there's m- probably thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of words of notes that I have that like when I'm flying across the country, I'll have some like weird thought and I'll just jot it down and and stuff. So, it's there. I just gotta, I just gotta do it. Hundred percent, bro. Dude, you need to. I think I told you that like two years ago. It's like, please finish this because it was it yeah. was thousands and thousands and thousands of notes at that time. Also, I know. Thanks. I suck. I appreciate it. Thank you. I got your back, um, homie. I got your back every time. We'll talk more about it on the time. road trip to broke back. Sounds good. Okay, uh, Scott Frederick. Are you good with more questions coming from the audience? Sure. You know okay. I can't quit you, right, Corley? I have heard that. I can't. <laughs> that's quit what you. Brian. That's what Brian Brush says every time. <laughs> Uh, Scott Frederick said, with the newer... Se- oh, wait, we had that one, didn't we? Yeah. Read it yeah. again. What was the newer No, it was, sen- it was the new sensitive culture. I'm sorry. I just didn't oh. I-, I didn't update. That was me. Jonathan Fateg said, what advice do you have for weeding out non-hackers that try their best to hide and deflect from their deficiencies as opposed to work on them? So the mut- basically the mutts that try to hide in the weeds and uh, deflect. Um, I think you just have to put people in a position where they, where they feel comfortable and uh, will come out of their shell. Cause a lot of those people that are mutts, they feel a lot of shit talking and don't feel very comfortable with their skill set or anything that, that they're really doing. So they, they like to just talk shit about the people who give a shit about the job. And so if you make them feel comfortable and, you know, take them aside in a quiet moment and show them something, Hey, here's, here's something that I learned at a class that made my life a lot easier. Can I show you something that's easy and you'll feel like a superstar? And I've actually done that with people. And I'm like, oh, this is cool. And then they actually wanted to get out and start teaching these things to people. Oh, wow. Like, oh, well, you know, there's actually, you know, I mean, and these were people that I didn't think gave a, you know, didn't care about the job at all. Right. And then uh, they're like, oh, and they were taking people aside and showing them. And, you know, they, they knew just enough to be dangerous, but they nonetheless were excited about the job. But I think that if, if you take people aside and, and you know, yeah, I, there's so many people out there that have so many strengths that, that aren't utilized because they're frustrated or, or whatever. And I've had those talks with people too. I'm like, Hey, you know, listen, I, I know what you're capable of. I've, I've seen it and, and I know you're frustrated, but I need that person that you are when you do that, when you do that, you're as good as anybody. Right. Um, and then when you do the other thing, you're, you're as destructive as anybody. So let's, let's work more on this and I'll support you in that. And I'll try to try to, you know, put you in a position where you can have, you know, do more of that. Dude, I absolutely love that, man. I love that. Cause, uh, I, I have this whole mantra, this personal mantra of right versus effective, right? Cause we love being right. I love to be right. I get in an argument with my wife. I love to be right. You know what I'm saying? But I'm not very effective when I'm right. It's not always a, it, either or, but a lot of times, you know, especially in the wife analogy, it's, it's, I'm sleeping on the couch, but I was right. Damn it. 
And uh, so I'm never, I'm never right with her. <laughs> believe me. That's why I'm on the couch, <laughs> yeah. but, uh, but it's right versus effective. And I know my guys hear this all the time. So they're rolling their eyes. If anybody hears this podcast where they're like, Oh God, here we go. Right versus effective. But ultimately that's what you're talking about. When you're connecting with these people, you're being effective and it's, and it's disconnecting from being, uh, uh, I'm right. in the fact that you should be engaged in this over here, but I'm finding a way to be effective with what you're good at and then plugging you in so that, you know, it's the long game again. Right. And you, you play to people's strengths, right? And there's, like I said, there's so many passionate, talented people out there that if you put your ego aside and if, if they lash out at you or act out towards you and you just go, Hey, okay, I understand that this is, this is a, and you're internalizing this. You say, this is a you thing, not a me thing. And, and we're going to get through this. You know what I mean? It's this yeah. is years of therapy. Um, but, um, <laughs> but uh, no, I mean, I, I just, I think that, you know, uh, you can, you can, you're not always going to turn everybody around and you got to realize that too. But if you get a couple people to, to, you know, go in a different direction and take that negative energy and turn it into a positive thing. And most of the time I think if people are negative than the organization because they have a ton of, of positives that they can bring to the organization, but they're, they're so stifled and so frustrated that they're told no, 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 all the time, because when they want to bring something forward, it makes work for somebody else and nobody wants to do more work. Right. So support those people and, and, and help them out. All right. Back to me being a fanboy. One of my absolute favorite things I learned from you. Okay. Uh, if you know me, I am a fanboy and fully involved and specifically Mark Von Oppen. Uh, but one of the things I learned from you is that we need to stop saying bad leadership. Quit defining what it isn't you know what i'm saying so right do it. well I, I, I dude i love this man i really do i i wrote like i'm not this shameless book this is the it says not for resale it's really getting close to coming out but i have a whole section on there where i talk about i won't use the word bad leadership in this book because of your influence on me in this regard so go ahead well thanks that's awesome no i i think that i just I, my whole point with that is stop using the word leadership to define what leadership isn't Right. It's like it's it's like when you say leadership, that to me that's a positive thing. And then when you say bad leadership, well, it's like okay. And I don't know what that word or that phrase would be, but it's like I just you know it's bad leadership, bad leadership, bad leadership. Well, bad leadership by its very nature is not leadership. So stop using that word. So it's beautiful. um, No, it made me start saying when you are put in a position to be responsible for people. You know what I'm saying? Instead of saying when you were made a leader, because you're not made a leader, you know, right. you're not, you know, it's, it's, you're put in a position of authority to make decisions and take care of people. You know, that's, that's what given rank is or put being promoted is, is now well, you I think make the key thing that you said, the key thing that you said in that statement is you're given all of these, these tasks that you're supposed to accomplish. And Oh, by the way, you have to take care of people. Take care of these people. Yeah. And when you take care of people, and you accomplish all those things, that's when you're leaving. When you're checking all these things off your list and not taking care of people, taking care of yourself, then you're being something other than a leader. Whatever that whatever that non term is, we need a term for it. That's your next challenge. Got, I've got some that I won't won't say. We'll read them in deliberate leader in the glossary. <laughs> you already wrote that chapter. I gotta write a different chapter now. Okay. Thanks for killing my, my use the, don't use the L word when it's not the L word. That's my you job. stole it from me. That's my job. I, actually, <laughs> hey guys, look for the deliberate leader from Firehouse Vigilance. It's all. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Okay. Uh, if you want to be a badass at work, uh, if you want to be a badass, work at it. That's the, that's the meme. I, I love this. If you don't, keep making excuses about who or what's holding you back. Another one of yours. Right, we just had this discussion about the book. So, um, <laughs> so, so no, tell me, I, st- what, that, what that gets back to is like I never got good at anything by not doing it, right? And and somebody said um, to me, uh, or they they reposted that meme today, and I, I read it and said, if you want to be a badass, you got to do badass things. True, right? So, I mean, if if you want to be good at your craft, you want to be considered a badass in the fire service, you have to practice you know, the mundane uh, things that nobody wants to do over and over and over and over again until they become muscle memory. And, and, you know, you got to work at it. Like I said, I never got good at anything by not doing it. You don't, don't get good at doing anything by sitting in the recliner, you know? So, um, so get out, you know, and, and, and 
live it, love it, break shit, do shit. You know, that's, that's what that one's all about. I love it, man. I absolutely love it. Uh, Andrew Feskins said, what is the one teaching moment? And we've touched on this, but I really like this question. What is the one teaching moment or skill that you picked up from your dad that's been the most influential and relatable to you and the fire service? Oh gosh. Um, I think just the, the relationship thing, like where it's, you know, it's, it's creating trust and taking the time to, to sit and talk to your people and really show that you have a genuine interest in them and that you care about their growth and their development. Um, and that's, what's going to make them go that extra mile for you, you know? Um, you know, because people want to believe in something. They want to also know that 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 you believe in them and that you're going to have their back. Um, so I think that that's the biggest thing. And that was like the biggest epiphany for me was because I always felt like a lot of times that, that, you know, when I was growing up that I had really great coaching growing up, you know, and, and I always felt that those people, you know, had my back, but nobody ever sat me down and like had an expectation talk. And that's where the whole... 10 for you, 10 for me thing came, came from with fully involved was from my dad, from he would sit with his players and talk with them and say, this is what I give to you as a coach. This is what I promise to give to you as a coach. And you can hold me to this. And in exchange for that, this is what, you know, um, this is what I expect from you. And I'm going to hold you to that because that's my job. Um, and it, that, that transcends, you know, sport and, and the workplace and it gets into parenting and things sure. like that. So it's, there's so many things, especially now, like with, with so many young people coming into the fire service, I really feel I take that obligation, you know, um, almost more seriously than ever. You know, I always, I always felt like I took it seriously, but now I've, now that I'm really, really facing, you know, probably the last at most five years of my career, I, I really feel like, you know, that, that example that I'm trying to set is really, really important. And, and I, I don't always hit the mark. I try. But, um, yeah, it, 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 in answer to that question, it's probably the relationship aspect and that everything in life is about relationships and, and trying to, you know, work with people. Love it, man. Uh, Valerie Marshall Solano says, in your 10 for me, 10 for you, have your 10 points changed over time or have they stayed constant? They stayed constant. Um, hi, Valerie. I know Valerie. Uh, okay. Valerie's cool. Love it. Um, yeah. So, um, they stayed constant. I mean, there's, there's a little bit, you know, the interpretation of it maybe has changed a little bit as my perspective, um, has widened because every class that I go to, we, we talk about the 10 for you, 10 for me, we do a group discussion and that sort of thing. And, and I, I really do enjoy those group discussions because, you know, a lot of times I'll hear different things from different people and it changes my perspective. It's something unique that I haven't heard before. So, you know, as far as the, the, the points go, those are from my dad, from, 40 years of football coaching and I, you know, um, out of, you know, sort of paying homage to him, I haven't changed them. Um, and I don't feel like I need to, because I think that, that they are transcendent, you know? So, um, you know, maybe just the, 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 the nuance of it or the subtleties of it have maybe changed a little bit, but the, the overall message is, has remained the same. Stays constant. No, no, I, 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 and cause I saw you like, for me very early on uh, and then i've seen it recently and and it's just a, it's a very consistent message and i love it jonah fatigue said what do you think is more important having hardcore continuity amongst your specific crew or being solid as an overall shift or company well i think it starts it's uh, i i don't know that i can't i again there's there's some things that i think are it's yes <laughs> that's the answer it's, to everything yeah i agree i like that yeah, i like that answer a lot it's not they're all important but i think if if you're really looking at how you start it you start with yourself you start with your crew and then you take those people and the the you know the consistency that you bring to that crew as as people fly the nest you know and, and leave and go out within the organization, that message starts to spread. And that's when within your platoon, um, you know, you can, or your battalion, you can start to grow that message and get the consistency within the battalion. And then within that battalion, as people start to filter out, you know, into, into different battalions, that's when it starts to, but, but certainly you have to have shift commanders that are all on the same page and have a consistent message. I think that sometimes that's difficult because personalities play, play a part and all that stuff. But I think that you got to start small and think big. And everybody wants 
sweeping change and they want everything right now. And I was certainly guilty of that. I still am at, at some points, but um, start small, think big, and, and then um, start with your company. And, and, you know, like I said, when you start looking at, at, at what the message has been as, as people start to work together and it starts to grow, you have to be, you have to be remind, right. Remind each other of how things have changed and how right. things have progressed because uh, you can't always see it when you're too close to it. But I think that, <laughs> you know, they're all important, but if you're looking for a starting place, start with your company and start with you and, and, and grow that philosophy from there. All right. You ready for a personal, you're a captain, you lead a crew, John, <laughs> John M. Sullivan has a great question here. He says, is it a good or bad thing, in your opinion, to be hard to read by your crew when it comes to how you're truly feeling about a situation versus how you are reacting to it? I like this question. I've never had this question before. I actually like it. I want to see what Mark does with it. I don't know how I feel what? about it. I don't know what. Um, <laughs> don't, don't make me think too hard. I, I need another beer. Um, no, I'm being hard to read as far as it applies to a certain situation. Um, no, I like people to know me, know what I'm thinking, call me by my first name, that kind of thing. Um, uh, so, I mean, in terms of like not knowing what I'm thinking or whatever, I, I think that we want to know each other so well on a crew that we can finish each other's thoughts and mm -hmm. we see things through the same eyes. I like that. That's how I feel about it. Yeah. Um, you know, um, that was kind of a tough one, but you know, in terms of having a poker face, uh, in certain situations, yes, I think you need one. And, and I, I do wish I had one. I don't. <laughs> um, and, and it gets me in trouble and my guys know it too. Like, Oh right. shit. Yeah. Mark's got the red ass, you know? So, I mean, it's like, <laughs> you know, so, um, yeah, I, I, I think that again, uh, we, we need to know what each other's thinking. We need to know each other's, especially, you know, it, it, that goes deeper to, you know, knowing when, when someone's hurting or how they're feeling. No, you know? and, and that goes for me too. It's, you know, cause you know, certainly in the fire service, there's so much more awareness of mental and emotional health um, that we, we need to, we need to know how people normally behave so that when something's off, we can help out. And it got, and, and, and I let you answer the question while I thought about it, but I really do like what you said there. I want, as a battalion chief, I want my captains. I don't want them wondering, being me being hard to read. Whenever a situation comes up, I want them to already know what my reaction is going to be. Like I want them already predicting my reaction because we know each other that well. Right, and when when the reaction is something that you didn't expect or they didn't expect. And you have a group chat. You talk to him about it. Yeah, hey, absolutely. This was this was a weird circumstance. This is what happened, and here's how we dealt with it. And in the future, here's how we're going to deal with it next time. Love it. It's all about. I mean, you have to have a plan for your people, and you have to have a plan. Just like arriving at a fire, you have to have a plan for that. You have to have a plan for leadership. I mean, you can't just show up and go. Oh, figure it out when we get there. I mean, you gotta you gotta be thinking about this long before you land in that seat. You know what I mean? It's like, it's, it's, it's something that you have to be prepared for. You may think that you're ready, but you have to be prepared. No, I'm, so. and John, he said, thanks for the answer. I agree and feel the exact same way. Glad I could pose a good one. Uh, and it was a good okay. one. That was a good, that was a good question. I really do feel like a tough I, one. Let's end on that one. Bye. Okay. I'm going to hang up now. Just, All right. See you later. No, uh, where is my notes? I'm like trying to find them, but I am ready. I'm ready. Let me see if I got one more to throw at you. Um, I like this one. Christopher Snow wants to know, Mark, being in the California region, what are some golden nuggets you can share on tour experience of wildland firefighting uh, in the in the wildland urban interface environments? What can I share with that? Just nuggets. Um, uh, in terms of being out and about on deployments and, and being out for a really long time, I had the good fortune uh, the reason why I bid the engine company that I, I bid on um, is because we're our first out um, statewide mutual aid engine. Um, but because of uh, staffing shortages and stuff, we haven't gone out in a couple of years. Um, but I think that the biggest thing for me is know yourself um, before you go out on those big deployments. And I mean, I think I was out for something like 40 days two years ago. 
two years ago or a year ago or something like that. But we were on some huge fires and, and we were out with the same group of people and, and the guys that I worked with were great. And um, I found out a lot about myself um, and what I didn't, what I found out I didn't always like. And so pace yourself, like if you're out on those big incidents and stuff and then really be again, deliberate in your leadership and deliberate in your every interaction and pause and know that you're tired and know that um, I think that's the biggest takeaway that I had was there were times where um, I wasn't always who I wanted to be. And luckily because, you know, we, had such a great group of people on the strike team and on the task force that I was on, um, uh, both on the engine company that I was on and, and surrounding us that, you know, we all picked each other up. Right. Um, so, um, but know that you have resources available to you that if you're losing your shit, you can talk to somebody. <laughs> so and it's a them. long time, man. Yeah. No. no. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's a long time to be out there and, 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 uh, um, that was my first experience really being out and gone for that long. And it was, it was humbling. Yeah. So know your resources and look out for your, your brothers and sisters, man, like 100%. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, final question before I go to books and, and the five questions. So I'm going to bring this was, this is from the other Valerie. There's two Valerie's watching tonight. I think Valerie mentioned something about the two women watching tonight are both named Valerie, but Valerie Tessier said, what has been one of the most cathartic career moments that led to a big change for you? cathartic um i think the biggest change for me um and i won't go into too too much detail about it um was you know along with that earlier part of the discussion where we talked about you know the world not needing me to fix it or the world not necessarily needing to conform to mark von oppen's vision of reality right um, i really like what do i talk about myself in the third person um but uh <laughs> But I think the biggest change for me was, um, you know, about 12 years ago, 10 or 12 years ago, um, I I was so ate up for the job that I pushed myself and pushed myself and pushed myself and was so angry that um, about things that I couldn't control that it really started to affect affect my home life. Um, My my work life balance wasn't there. And and I, I basically was so stressed out that that I put myself into AFib and had to go to the hospital and get cardioverted. And it was through working through that process of being off for a month and, you know, talking to some of the doctors and, 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 you know, basically they, they cardioverted me and, and I was going through this whole thing in my mind where I'm like, Oh, I'm going to be clinically dead for a period of time. And hopefully this works and I'll come back. And as I was working my way through the process of trying to deconstruct how I got there, um, it was really eye opening because they would they the doctors would ask me, Are you under a lot of stress? And and I would think about going on calls and that kind of thing. I'm like, oh, no. You know, I I like going on calls and we're busy and at the time I worked on our busiest engine company in town and now they're all busy about the same. But I loved it. We're running the wheels off the rig and everything and, and uh and then um but what I really started to think about was being super stressed out, stressed out about the things that I couldn't control and things that, that I was trying to control so tightly that it, it, you know, gave me a heart condition that went away. But, um, you know, it was really humbling. And, and when your body starts to react that way and it doesn't work the way that it used to and and um, you have to make some lifestyle changes, um, that was probably the most humbling and cathartic moment, I guess, for me um, was, you know, when that happened, I really reevaluated what was important to me and how my approach to the job shifted quite a bit. Um, you know, I, I, again, I, I wasn't trying to control the things that I couldn't control and just try to affect the circle that I could affect. And, and one of the things that was a big help for me was, you know, the, the community that, that rose, um, around fully involved and, and, uh, um, supported me and nobody knew that stuff was going on 10 years ago, but, um, I'm pretty open about it now. But, you know, having that outlet and having that creative outlet and and having people respond to it in a positive manner really helped me work through that time. Love it. I guess that's probably the biggest life-changing moment for me in in terms of my career, yeah. It sounds like it, just in your voice and the inflection and things like that. I want to make a joke, but it's uh, so inappropriate right now with that solemn answer. Go ahead. ahead. Are you going to retire and move to Oklahoma and hang out with Brush and Moore? No. (laughs) No. 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 I thought you were right. no. Anyway, 
Uh, yeah, maybe. It was know. too easy an answer. I don't know. Being in the center of the country is... Uh, it's, it's called the Middle cool. Coast. I mean, it's like, yeah, the Middle Coast. You can fly anywhere and be anywhere in the country in like three hours. It's yes. Awesome. It's awesome. It really is. Mm-hmm. Uh, where was I at? Book or books, man. I, it's always interesting when I ask you about book or books because uh, you have you have very uh, staunch opinions on books. So I, I love to ask you, book or books that you think firefighters should be reading? Um. In terms of leadership stuff, I don't know if I said this last time, but one of my favorite leadership books is The No Asshole Rule. I don't know if you've heard that. I haven't read it. By, no, no. It's, it's by Jonathan Sutton, I think is his name. He's a Stanford PhD. Um, but it's great. It talks about, in fact, the funny story about that is I was talking with this super senior captain who um, was getting ready to retire when I got promoted my first assignment as a captain. And he would work. I was open shifted for a driver, and so he would drive for me. Um and uh, we used to talk for hours and hours and hours about like his 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 philosophy on being captain and what he liked to do. Anyway, um, he was vastly different from me in terms of you know he was really mellow and very California, and I was like super amped and super stoked and like just you know on fire and stuff all the time. And, and he says to me, he goes, "Have you read?" Uh, he was talking about leadership books. And he goes, "Have you read the No Asshole Rule?" And I said, "No, I haven't." He goes, "You should." <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, what's that supposed to mean? And so he goes, no, 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 I don't mean it that way. But he goes, you should read it. It's a really good book. But it talks about how destructive those people are in the workplace and, and stuff uh, like that. And uh, whoops, uh oh, no, you're it back. Disappeared. Am I? Am I you're still back. on? You're okay. solid. Right now you are. Okay. okay. Um, I don't know what just happened. Oh, I got a text message right in the middle of the thing. I'm trying to get rid of it. I'm um, making a TikTok. But uh, yeah, yeah. Um, there's that one. Uh, some of the stuff that I've, you know, like I, I mentioned, uh, the subtle art of not giving a fuck by by Mark Manson, I think is his name. Um, Egos the enemy is another good one I that I read. It. Yeah, it's. Um, but th- these were all recommended to me, um, apparently because uh, I have a huge ego and I'm I'm an <laughs> asshole in the workplace. <laughs> but um, what else? Uh, Fight Club was another one that was super influential um, in terms of. Um, you know, like the whole rogue thing and, and, uh, um, and, and from reading fight club, uh, another book that I read that was kind of influential on me in terms of, of, you know, letting things kind of happen organically and not trying to control things too much. Um, you know, the whole idea of impermanence, which is an Eastern philosophy, but Buddhism for beginners is another book that I read, which is, interesting because if you read fight club there's so many buddhist references and eastern philosophy references in that book um that people aren't even really hip to right. um and then if you read buddhism for beginners you're like oh, oh like Everything fight club's clicking. all fight club's all about buddhism so anyway um just i just i like to read things that make me think in a different direction um uh, because i was raised a certain way and I, I just like to see different perspectives so you know those are those are a couple of that for Fight Club, Ego's the Enemy, No Asshole Rule. Um, Buddhism for Beginners. S- subtle Art, Buddhism for yeah. Beginners. That's five. Yeah. You got, you got at least. Out. There's probably I'm like nine, nine there that you actually mentioned. All right. Yeah. Originally when you came on, we did the five questions for firefighters. You answered those, but eventually we got rid of them. And we, now we do the next five questions for firefighters. So, Mark Vaughn Oppen, there are no right answers. The oh, points dude, are, I hate this one. I hated the, this one the last time you did it. There's so much pressure. The so points like are that. arbitrary, and they're assigned mainly by the audience, but really... Oh, um, great. Yeah. <laughs> this is going to prove how poorly I think on my feet, so thanks. Mark Von Oppen, are you ready for the next five questions for firefighters? Go. All right, let's do it. Wait, am go. I supposed to answer them? What am I supposed to do? Or is this yeah, you, just, you, yes? ans- you answer them, yes, 100%. Like, I'll, oh, okay. You could try and dodge them, but... We'll see how that works out. What single characteristic... Question number one. What single characteristic makes the difference between a run-of-the-mill firefighter and the top-tier, go-to, badass firefighter? Humility. Ooh, that's a fast answer, too, man. Any conversation on it? As soon as as you stop being humble, you're going to get humbled. That's what's going to happen. So, I mean, I think that if if you're a great badass firefighter, you're somebody that realizes that nothing is constant except for change, and you got to constantly learn. And so, you know, as soon as you think you got it all nailed, the world knocks you on your ass. I love this. Here's the thing. 
and and most people don't know this. Usually when I'm doing a scrap, I a week out, I send an email off to the the guest and say, "Hey, here's what to expect, blah blah blah, T- send me topics and things like that." And also, hey, by the way, here's the questions for the next five questions for firefighters I'm going to ask you. I never sent the email to Mark, A, because all we did was text a few times and say, what do you want to talk about? So one of the most kick-ass things right now is, is he didn't know that question, and that was the fastest answer I have ever heard on that question, man. 100% uh, max points on well, humility. Let's see how, slow, how slow I am on the next four. Go. <laughs> if you could go back in time and give yourself one piece of advice as a rookie, what would it be? Be patient and keep your mouth shut. Pick your battles. All right, nah, you can't I, fight them all. I think that's been a recurring theme throughout the night as far as what mm-hmm. you've learned in your career, dude. That's beautiful. Number three, max points on one and two. I will absolutely agree with that. What is your favorite training drill? Uh, search. I like, uh, I like doing VEIS. That's my, probably my favorite thing to do. Teaching that and practicing that skill my favorite thing to do can there it is search ves number four what mistake have you learned the most from in your fire service career um probably being a little bit too candid with people um and and wanting to take back some of the things that i said to people early in my career when i was young and immature and again that gets back to uh keeping your mouth shut and being patient waiting your turn a little bit you know i think everybody thinks that they can you know and we we pump people up saying that you can lead, you can lead, you can lead, you can lead. Like when you're brand new and everything, you, it, it's hard to do that. Um, I think you can exhibit leadership qualities. Um, but yeah, I wish there, there are some things that I, some things that I said and did to some people like early in my career that were a little bit callous, uh, because I was arrogant and thought I knew everything. We all do when we're young, we, <laughs> we are all, all arrogant. We all know everything. I mean, I, my, my son does the same shit to me, so I, I get it. I understand, you know, but how amazing is that? You're like, you're just looking at him going, and now I understand my dad when he shook his head at me, you know? So yeah, but we all get there. It's a circle <laughs> of life, right? So. Uh, Rafiki. No, yeah. It's Rufasa. Yeah. Uh, heavy fire. <laughs> Number five, heavy fire, searchable space. This is the original question. Would you rather be assigned to the nozzle or first in on VES? Search. Easy answer. Yeah. I want to get I want to get in there and do that. I mean, being in first in on the nozzle is awesome and everything. But it seems like fires go out so quick. It's like, oh cool, fire's out. Now what? Right. You know, I wanna you know what I mean? It's, and you know, I tell I tell, you know, the young guys that I'm working with now, I said, you know, we're gonna default to aggressive. We're gonna um, we're out here on the south end of town for a long time by ourselves and, and you know, um, people live in homes and, you know, we're very suburban where we are. So it's like, you know, if, if we're waiting and we're not sure we're, we're going in, we're going to go in and we're not waiting for somebody else to show up. We're it. So, um, and you can, when you say those things to them, people that they light up, like, Oh yeah, it's awesome. yeah we're but, doing it's like, it. but I mean, that's, that's the, I mean, that's the job, right? So. There it is. The next five questions for firefighters. High fives and Gatorade. That's what Smoothbore Cartel said. Uh, I love it, man. I love it. Absolutely. Five questions, five max points. I don't think anybody can argue. And that officially makes it 154 scraps in the books. My man, Mark Von Oppen, how can people get a hold of you, get in touch with you, reach out to you, book a class? Go. Uh, well, they can, uh, send me an email, Mark Von Oppen, my name at yahoo.com. Uh, not my name, but Mark Von Oppen at yahoo.com. Uh, they can call me, send me a text message, my uh, phone numbers. And I'm just remember that if you're calling from the East coast, I'm on West coast time. So, uh, eight o'clock in the morning is pretty early, uh, on the East coast for me. So it's, uh, my phone number is 408-888-7763. Um, or they can reach me on fully involved, um, on Facebook or, uh, instagram at fully involved official um but feel free to drop me a line i like to chat with people and 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 meet people and you know talk about whatever you want to talk about so thanks for having me on the show man it was awesome i I, i'm not gonna lie to you i have tremendous anxiety about doing these things seriously Um, oh i hate them but it was super nice it was super fun uh okay okay um i mean i don't i don't hate them but i just i know what you mean i just 
they just I, I sit around all day waiting for it to happen. I go, oh my god, I hope I don't screw this up for Corley. So, um, <laughs> but thank you. Dude, you absolutely crushed it. I think value for the fire service across the board. Anybody anybody who bothers to listen on the podcast or tuned in live, man, 100% value for the fire service. Fire service wins because you were on here today. Uh, wrapping it up, uh, everybody, go to firehousevigilance.com. The Vigilantes is live. You can join it. Go to firehousevigilance.com. Join up. Be a part of the, the Vigilantes, the discussion there. Uh, I can't hype it enough. The third form is coming up on August 30th of this month. So get in before we do it. Um, where else am I at? I'm trying to read my notes. Uh, yes, it was next stop for me. Water on the fire in Pensacola. It's going to be an amazing time. I get to present the nine L's. If you are there, come check out the nine L's and everybody's there. I'm going to try. I don't know how many people I can get to sign it, but Taylor, Made this, and uh, it's amazing. Let me find my mouse here so I can see what I'm looking at. Water on the fire. I'm going to get as many people as I can to sign the back of this to go up there on the collection and just add to it. Because when, when, when this whole ride is done and everything is done, when I retire and hang up that bunker gear, I am going to have a wall of tins, and, and it's going to have a ton of signatures on everything I've been to. It's going to be a good time. So uh, please, 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 I mean this from the bottom of my heart. If you see me there, Tell me, hey, let's get a picture because I'm the world's worst at saying let's get a picture. So do it with me and because uh, I want to remember these things. That covers Water on the Fire. Uh, I'm pretty excited. Nine L's, like I said, really excited on almost finishing the book, the Nine L's that goes with the class. I really thought when I ordered this, I was going to be like, yeah, it's great. Let's let's order the final prints. But I'll try to show you a page of like right here. That's all the notes and edits and everything added to it that has to change. So not the point. Uh, it will be done soon because I'm working on the rewrite. Uh, who's coming up, pulling up Devin Craig, Mike Dugan, Robbie Townsend, Dina Ali, Chad Bootsine, Bill Gustin, Keith Nyman, Jay Bonifield, man, that's the next, I don't know how many I rattled off. The scrap is loaded with guests. And so it's going to be an amazing time for the fire service. Uh, please, please, please tune in live and bring your questions because your questions are what make the scrap amazing. Um, last thing I'll say, and I'll quit with all my housekeeping, is wherever you listen to the scrap as a podcast, go and rate it. Give it five stars. Don't give it four. Give it five. Five is better than four. So give it five stars and then take a screenshot of it, send it to me, and I will bribe you with sticker packs and lots of stickers uh, from the Must Don't Scrap to the Vigilant Creed, and everything in between. I will send you stickers for rating it. Uh, don't need it rated on Facebook. I need it on the podcast formats. So that's what I'm after. Five-star reviews. Screenshot it. Other than that, thank you for my sponsors. 100% Keyhoes, Elkhart Brass, Affordable Drill Towers, and Fit to Fight Fire. Uh, thank you for being there. My brother, Mark Von Oppen. Thank you for coming back and once again being an amazing guest. Thank you, man. It was a pleasure. Please, audience, uh, tune in next time. Remember, mutts don't scrap. I hope the tone stays silent unless it's burning. Everybody, stay safe out there.